My name is Kevin Locks. Thanks everybody for coming out to this. Uh, this is PowerShell GUI, a uh, guided or guided tour. Tried to do a little bit of a play on words there. Um, you guys have seen this slide plenty of times. These are the sponsors for the event, so we want to thank them. Uh, a lot of the stuff we're able to do, you know, we're not going to be able to do without them. And so it's appreciated. Uh, who am I? Uh, I am a principal engineer of automation, scheduling, and orchestration services. It's a mouthful. Um, I'm actually a bit more of a manager, switch back to engineering role type thing. Um, but uh, I do a lot of work with uh, automating incident tickets and things like that that come through one desk and service form, or sorry, that come through service now, uh, and uh, forms that come in and things like that to automate provisioning and scaling of uh, uh, disk space and things like that. Uh, I'm a PowerShell user for a little over 10 years now. I started around PowerShell 3. I co-lead the Research Triangle PowerShell user group. Uh, you won't normally see me talking there, but I do a lot of the YouTube videos. We have a ton of YouTube videos out there, over 120, so it's a really great resource. I co-authored uh, the PowerShell Conference Book Volume 3. Um, I also worked on modern IT automation with PowerShell. I did lightning demos when uh, PowerShell Summit was virtual a few years back. When I originally put this together, I had a nice professional picture of me. I saw it this morning and I was like, you guys can already see my face. So I thought I'd put something up that's a little more interesting. Uh, this is my, my brother and I at the, Go uh, the GoPro track in uh, North Carolina for karting. Um, I love cars, love racing, love a lot of stuff that's fast. And so I thought I'd throw that up there. It tells you a little bit more about me. The purpose of this talk. So this talk really came about because in the PowerShell user group, I'm not gonna say all the time, oops, but fairly often people come in and we have some time before the meetings where we talk and, and people can ask questions. And I feel like over and over again, I hear people say, well, how do I get going with building a GUI? You know, I wanna build a GUI for this. I wanna build a GUI for that. And while this isn't specifically about where I'm gonna go through and do an in-depth step-by-step, -step, here's how you, you know, build out your form and then here's how you, you know, add a click event and all that kind of stuff. What I wanted to do is uh, go through the when, why, and should you build a GUI, right? Because a lot of cases don't necessitate a GUI. There might be some that, that do. Um, and I wanna make sure that you have the tools available to you to build a GUI when that, that situation arises. I wanna discuss, um, you know, the pitfalls of building a GUI. Um, and, you know, as I've, I've kind of alluded to is, I'm not trying to tell you, hey, here's the tool you're supposed to use. It's, it's not an endorsement. Um, I'm not gonna do a deep dive into any specific tool. I'm just gonna show you some of the stuff that's available so that if you, you have that use case, you kind of know some of the avenues you can go down. So building a GUI, the reasons to build a GUI, I would say there's probably a lot more reasons not to build a GUI than to build a GUI. Uh, a lot of people are gonna tell you just, you know, flat out PowerShell isn't for GUIs or something like that. And I don't think that's the case. I think there's a lot of reasons to, to have a user interface. And the main reason to me is to allow non-PowerShell users to use your PowerShell modules and scripts, right? We're building tools, we're building things that are gonna provide value. And the more people we can get to use those, the more value it can provide, right? So if you just build something you're using yourself, you're gonna get X amount of value out of it. If you can have five, 10, 15 people using that same thing, you're multiplying you know, what you're able to do with, with the tools that you've built. The other reason, simplify complicated tasks. You might have some people that are PowerShell users, but by building out a GUI, you can kind of take them step by step through something and, and help them get to you know, some sort of code or something that's usable versus they don't know how to really connect everything together. And so a GUI can help with that. The reasons not to build a GUI, it's way more complex for development. You're gonna have way more lines of code. You're gonna to have to troubleshoot a lot more stuff. Testing is gonna become more difficult because now you're not worried just about, does my code work? I have this UI behind it. And if someone messes with this thing in a certain way, or they decide to change their mind and they've gone a couple things, you know, a couple steps into the, the UI and then they go back and they change something, does it still give me the output I expect? Um, it's difficult to automate a GUI, right? You're not gonna 
the, the quote I have here is, you know, the GUI is where the pipeline dies. Uh, I have no idea who said that. I've heard it before, but, you know, it is true, right? It, a GUI can provide value, but you're not going to automate on a GUI. So it's not really, depending on your use case, a GUI is not necessarily going to be the best thing for you to build. It's a crutch for users who could learn PowerShell. So if you're giving this to your operations or your support teams, and they now have this nice GUI that does everything that they need to do, they're never gonna have to get into PowerShell. So you kind of have to balance, should I build this GUI for them? There might be people that are just never gonna learn it regardless of whether or not they get in the shell, but it might also be something uh, where it could be a way to train them and, and get them to learn PowerShell. And then the other thing is cross-platform issues. As soon as you start building GUIs, stuff's just not gonna work on Linux or Mac or uh, some of the other platforms that you're gonna run uh, PowerShell on. And I have one other quote here, um, and it's just, it's something I tweeted a while back, and it was just, I had one of those days at work, and uh, I think this applies here, and it's, it's from the movie Jurassic Park. You know, you have Malcolm, and he says, uh, you know, the scientists were too pre preoccupied with whether they could, they didn't stop to ask if they should. I kind of felt like, you know, that with developers at work, right? So uh, you should ask yourself, should I be building this, um, you know, before you, you start, you know, going down that rabbit hole. So the way I broke up this top, uh, the, the way I broke up this talk is by breaking it into essentially three different levels, right? So I saw it as there's some stuff you can do before you actually get into building a full-fledged GUI that might give you just what you need for the use case that you have, where it's what I call built-in GUI stuff. Um, then I have, there's a bunch of different tools that help you build GUIs, which I'll go over some of those, but I'll show you mainly uh, just how you can kind of build out a, a GUI from scratch using XAML and, and uh, uh, Visual Studio Community Edition. I also have the, uh, the platform level, which is stuff like WebGIA and PowerShell Universal, where I'll show you just a little demo of, of what I'm doing that in that as well. So for the built-in stuff, uh, mainly I'm focusing on outhost, read host, out grid view, show command. Those are on the surface, you know, you think about those things and, and you're like, okay, I can show like a little grid view or I can, you know, show what a command looks like and get some sort of string back that shows me what the parameters would look like if I typed them in. But there are some kind of cool things that it was, I felt that they were really cool that I was able to make those do as far as providing UI elements to users. So. This might be something where if you want someone to learn PowerShell, you can kind of get them mess around a little bit with it without them having to know too much PowerShell. And I'm gonna start going into demos, but I wanna start by saying, use your imagination, right? What I'm gonna show you today, I had originally built out a lab and then I kept having like all these little issues with you know Active Directory not working and things like that. I was like, I don't wanna tempt the demo gods. All I'm gonna be doing is stuff on my local machine. I'm going to be creating user accounts. I'm going to be looking at my disk space. But imagine this as something you're using in a, an environment at scale where you're you know, doing stuff on Active Directory, you're running stuff against remote systems, um, and it's your support team, for instance, right? So just think about these things in ways that you could use them and wrap some of the stuff, the tools that you guys are already working on. All right, so I said I was gonna start with uh, read host, out grid view, and show command. So this one technically isn't a UI, it's still command line, but I wanted to show this because I think it's a really easy way to wrap some stuff up and give it you know, the instructions and things for someone to kind of step through it more easily. And it's basically just using your, your read host and your out host. You're gonna start with you know, write out, what do you want to do, right? Create a user, delete a user, lock, unlock, all that kind of stuff. And you're just going to read in their input. And you're going to take that input, run it through a switch statement, and you're going to call your functions for whichever input they want. And then in those functions, you'll do another read host for the parameters that are needed for that specific function. So all I'm doing here is essentially, yeah. Uh, are you supposed to be showing code? Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for reporting that out. 
Too much imagination, everybody else. Thank you for calling me out on that one. So I did find out on here when I, my screen is cloned, but when I do presentation, I get different stuff on this than that, but I still have to escape out of the presentation. So thank you for catching that. So anyway, um, what I have here is, you know, write ho host out the instructions, read host uh, your, you know, your choices, throw that into a switch statement, call out your functions. Your functions are gonna have, you know, whatever is code you wanna run with uh, a read host of, you know, the user account or whatever it is they need to do. And so I'll show you kind of what that ends up looking like. And so down here you'll have, you know, select an option. Okay, I wanna create an account. Let's hope I create an account. Here I'll do a, a big number so I create an account that I haven't created before because I have done this quite a few times on this computer. And it says there, created local user account, loops back to the beginning uh, menu, and now we can, you know, do other things with it, like lock the account, right? And I'll bring up computer management. And you'll see, I have my test 33 account in there and it's been disabled. So, like I said, use your imagination. This could be something for Active Directory. It could be a quick and easy tool. People who don't use PowerShell to just be able to run a couple commands. But let's take this and let's go add a little bit to, more to it. So, let me make sure I have this in the right order. Um, so this is something similar, but I've now taken it and I've added out grid view to it. So instead of presenting with the, the out host, I'm going to do my menu except out grid view with a hash table as my different items. Um, then when I get to locking and unlocking users, I'm going to uh, basically out grid view all of the users that are locked or all the users that are unlocked, right? Let me stop that. Because otherwise I'm not gonna run. And so I'll show you what this kind of looks like. So that was a similar, similar layout, right? Create user, delete user, lock user. And if I go in here and I say unlock user, hit okay. And I can see all my users that are locked. So I can say, oh, I wanna unlock Test 33, hit okay, that's unlocked. The interesting th thing with this is now I can do multiple accounts, right? So if I wanna shift click, I can do that, I can control click. And now I have a little bit of a menu system just using out grid view. So one thing to keep in mind when doing this is when you do out grid view, you have pass through, which is gonna take, uh, so that'll look like this. That's gonna take all of your uh, selections and pass it through. You also can set a title so you can tell people what you're doing. But when you're doing something like a menu, you have this output mode single, which is gonna tell it, I only want them to send a single item through. That way they can't select multiple things and essentially break stuff. A couple other things. Um, Cause I actually added some of this stuff this morning. I, I found a, uh, some good articles that I just never really thought about doing some of this stuff without grid view. Um, this one I thought was kind of interesting was uh, get command out grid view to get help and show window. And so I just thought this was a fun one for you run it. Oops, I need to close that first. You run it and it gives you a list of all your commandlets, and then you can go through and do get service. And then get your show window from it where you see all the, the, the help from that, that commandlet. So that might be a cool little one-liner you can hand to some people that don't know much about PowerShell and say, hey, if you need to find something out about commandlets, run this thing, search for the command that you wanna find, and then you know hit okay, show window. Now they can see all the information about the commandlet. Once again, that's one of those things that maybe that's too much of a crutch because now they're not gonna learn how to actually type in get help and stuff, but maybe you know, for someone who's absolutely just starting off, 
it's a good way to get them at least comfortable with, with messing around in PowerShell. Um, this is a similar one, uh, git history, uh, pass to invoke expression. That's gonna, I'll show it to you real quick, but it's basically gonna show you all your history. And then you can, when you select one of these, hit okay, it's gonna rerun it. So I thought it was a cool little script. And then this was the other one I was messing with this morning, which is something I just, I hadn't even thought of until I saw this. Um, and this is a little bit old, it's from uh, Bo Prox from an old uh, uh, blog post that he had, but he did, why am I not seeing run selection? He did a uh, disk space um, out grid view and using, let me show you the code for it real quick, but using a, a, a char, I think it's character 9012, uh, 9612. Um, he was basically able to make the, the bar in the out grid view to actually show like a, a you know, a, how much disk space is free in that. So I thought that was really cool use of it. And, and you know, these are all things that are just available to you in PowerShell that if you get a little creative, you can do some, some fun things with. So that's it for the out grid view stuff. The other thing I'd mentioned was your show command. So this is another one where I, when I first started doing this presentation, I hadn't even really thought much about it. Um, I had talked about it, I had done a presentation for my user group and uh, James Brundage was talking about all the metadata that's in, in your commandlets and stuff and your, your functions and modules. And it really got me thinking is show command takes all that metadata and pops it up to you, right? And you can see all that stuff and it's, it's got all the parameter sets and all that. So my thought was take all the commands I want the user bill to run, wrap it in parameter sets and just, you know, show command your function and then pass that uh, through to a variable, pass that variable to invoke expression. And now you have a, uh, you know, basically a kind of a cheap way to build a UI basically. And so I'll show this right here. And so I still have, you know, I have different tabs because different parameter sets for disabling, enabling uh, users. Um, and go in here and put in a user. And what I should see is that uh, that user gets locked when I do that. And like I said, it's just kind of a easy way to build out that UI type function without having to get into building forms and uh, or building XAML or doing any of that kind of stuff. So I have one more example and I thought it just added a, a tad more to this, which was combining both out grid view with show command. So when I take my output from stuff like lock or unlock, I can take that and I can do a search on it essentially, provide that out to out grid view, and now someone can see multiple users. So it's not just, you know, I just wanna do test one, two, three. I can actually just do test wildcard, get a list of all the users that come back from that, and then select, oh, I wanna disable this one, this one, this one. And so I'll show you that as well. And it's just to show the code so you see what I'm talking about. Um, you'll see here when I get the usernames, I do uh, the username to unlock, which is normally what I would just pass to the unlock. I now pass it to out grid view and uh, I pull back the names of those selected. And so you'll see here, it gave me back all of the test wildcard ones. So test 33 is what I wanted to do. Click OK. And now I'll do it again. I should see that it's enabled. All right. 
right, let's see if I can get my presentation back up. All right, looking good. So the next level of this, right, getting out of just what's built into PowerShell is what I'm gonna call the, the builders, right? Uh, this is not a comprehensive list. I'm sure there's other tools out there. These are the ones that I'm just aware of. So you have uh, Visual Studio, uh, Sapiens PowerShell Studio, Posh GUI, and PowerShell Pro Tools. Some of these are standalone tools. Some of these are tools that are actually like extensions into VS, uh, Visual Studio or VS Code. Um, and they'll give you the ability to build out your uh, interface and then add in the events and all that kind of stuff. Some of these will go straight out to uh, executables as well so that you have executable code instead of having a, you know, a, dot, a .ps1 file. And one thing I want to address before I start showing this off is the difference between WinForms and WPF. So when you're building, uh, when you're building a UIs, you have essentially the option of using WinForms or WPF. WPF, the Windows Presentation Framework, is essentially the more modern way to build your UI. It's going to have a little bit better flexibility with resolution scaling and you know when you're adjusting window sizes and stuff like that. It's done using XAML, so you're going to write your code and you're going to describe the UI in XAML. And you can see on the right, all of this in this here string here is the XAML that's describing what the form should look like. On the left in WinForms, you see it's a lot of, I create this object and then I add this to it and then I add a text, file, a text box and I add a label and I add a button. Um, you're doing essentially the same thing with the XAML. Uh, but it's described in, in this extensible application markup language, and it's all XML. And so then you'll import that XML and then uh, show your dialogue with that. So when I first put this together, I wanted to see what I could do just using something like ChatGPT. Because I was like, I wonder how good of a GUI I could get if I just describe it to, to uh, technically Copilot. I use the Bing Copilot, and um, I actually got, I thought, pretty good results. It took me basically about three prompts of, hey, I want this tech, I want a PowerShell application that launches a form. The form has a text box and it has a label and it has it should have this and that, and uh, the first time it came up and basically created most of it, but it was missing some, some stuff here and there. It was kind of more like a framework. And then I prompted it again and said, well, it should actually do these things. It should, when I click this, it should do that. And then uh, the second one actually worked pretty well. The third example I had uh, was just uh, a difference that I noticed in the way that the, uh, the users were presented, like when I went to go lock or unlock, didn't actually show the user, so I need to have it also create a refresh button to show me the list of users. And so this is the results of that, and so I'll show you what that looks like. And we'll start from there. And so this is, the, this is what I got from that. So once again, I can create my users, delete, lock, unlock. And like I said, when I f the second time I got this, I got pretty much this whole thing but there was no refresh button. So it's like, well, what am I deleting? So I got the refresh button and like I said, it's still not perfect, but it's a really great place to start from with you know whatever it is you're building out. And so I can go through and I can, I don't wanna delete this account yet. I'm like in this test 33 account, but I'm just gonna lock it and lock, unlock it. And so lock, test user 33 was disabled. And this is all just what Copilot gave me back. I, don't think I made any edits to this code from there. But let's say we do want to change it. We want to adjust the way the UI looks. We don't like the way the button or the text boxes go across the screen or the way that, you know, when I, I refresh that list, it went off the, the page. So let's say we actually want to go through and we want to take our XAML and we want to edit it to our own liking. Well, you can use Visual Studio Community Edition to copy in your XAML, make your edits, and then copy that back out. So I'm just gonna use the same project I have, but to get started, it's basically create a new project, 
WPF application and uh, you'll get to a screen that is basically like this. And it's your um, blank window and some files for the project. We're not too concerned with that part. Uh, the things we're concerned about are uh, the toolbox, your window down here that has your XAML in it, and then the properties uh, tab over here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the XAML. Oh, that's not the one I want. I'm going to copy that and I'm just gonna paste it in the XAML window down here. And now I've taken that same form that I had in PowerShell, I've now imported it into VS Code, and I can start to make adjustments to it, right? If I don't like the size of something or I don't like the layout of something, I can select it. I have the properties down here. I can go to the layout. I can say, you know what? I don't want this to be auto width. I want it to be 200. I can do that. Let's say I want it to align left. I can do that. I can make all the adjustments I need here and then I'll be able to take this, copy it back into PowerShell and uh, you know, actually write my code from there. So the toolbox on the side is gonna be how you're gonna add additional elements to this. So if you wanna add additional buttons or any of that, you can do that. One of the things uh, that you'll wanna take note of is the name of some of this stuff, right? As you're adding all these elements, you're gonna to wanna to have good names that you can reference. Um, and so that's just a, you know, key thing to be aware of because you'll start to lose track of, you know, is that a button? Is it a text box? Is it a label? Um, and which one is it? So it's good to have good naming there. So I'm not gonna copy this exact one because just like a cooking show, um, I already have one in the oven where I've made some of the updates. And this is the same code you had. I made a few updates uh, to make it look a little bit better not gonna say it's perfect. There still would be a lot more work with this. And that's why I say there's a lot more to building a UI because you have to worry about how things look now. Um, but let's, uh, what did I do here? I put something in here that's not supposed to be in here. Okay, there it goes, sorry. Um, so here's my new and improved UI. As you can see, stuff's not auto filling the page. So um, it looks a little bit nicer than, you know, just having these huge user boxes. Um, the create user button's a little bit better. Um, the main thing I changed here is under the delete user and lock user, I've created uh, a box that gets filled instead of it just taking up the whole screen. Um, now you'll see it populates in that box. I get a scroll button there, cleaner, nicer. Um, and like I said, still not a perfect UI, but it's, I wanted to show that, uh, you know, you can take that stuff, throw it into Visual Studio, make updates to it, make changes to it, and just clean it up um, from where you had it. Yeah, so the only thing, and I, sorry, I mentioned that, but maybe I went over it quickly, is when you make a new project, um, and I didn't do this just because I don't want to go through the naming of it and stuff, but you have a WPF application, and when you create that, you know, you create all the, the naming and stuff and the location for the solution, you'll get to this page here, but without the XAML on it. It'll be a blank window. Copy and paste it in, and then you can start messing with it. Or if you don't have any XAML, then you're starting from scratch and you just start adding text boxes and then you copy that out. Um, I'm wondering how you would handle input validation. Um, you have to handle that in code, right? So you're gonna, when you, 
when you take that, uh, let's see here. When you get that data, what you're gonna have to do is encode. Um, you're gonna have to say, I got this, you know, was I expecting that? And this, this is where UIs get really tricky is because now you have this data that comes in and let's say um, password, for instance, it can't have certain characters or username can't have certain characters in it. Now you gotta take that and say, this didn't have the right characters. Now I need to maybe put a label on the, the window and I need to update that label that says, hey, you use this character and it's wrong. And then I need to reset that text box so that it's blank again for them to re-enter. So would we be able to block the say the submit button until it is valid? Uh, that is possible. Um, there's a ton of stuff. Because when you do, like I said, I wasn't gonna go deep into how to build UIs, but when you build your UIs, there's tons of events that you can set for everything. So input into a, a text box is an event, right? Um, uh, so what you can do is, as it's inputting, you constantly check when there's input, what's in there, is this valid? Yes, okay, I can enable the, the, the submit box, right? You can do that, but that's one of those things where the more stuff like that you're doing, that's just so much more code and so much more overhead. And so it's something you have to think about is, is it worth it for me to do all of this stuff? Because is it providing enough value to the user, right? So it, it's one of those trade-offs and it's gonna depend on your use case and stuff like that. And you'll find later that maybe some of those cases, there might be better tools for that um, than you going and building something from scratch. Um, and one other thing I wanted to show on this. So with XAML, um, because essentially you're just importing the XML, um, it's, I have it as a here string in here. You also have the, the capability of having it externally. So you can do uh, git content, xaml.xaml, which is the, this file I, I created, does the same exact thing, works the same way. So at a certain point that might become easier for managing you know, the UI versus the code. But then again, if you're trying to, if you're looking at everything in one you know, PowerShell file, you might want to be able to reference back to the XAML and say, hey, uh, up here, oh, I called this that. Okay, I, I need to change it down here. And this is, essentially, this is the free way to do it. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of tools like PowerShell Studio, um, which I've used in the past. It's a really great tool for doing this. Uh, it's not necessarily cheap, but it gives you a lot of functionality there. Um, things like PowerShell Pro, Pro Tools, I'm aware of it, I haven't used it, but that actually brings more uh, capability into Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code to build out UIs with PowerShell. So j there's a lot of tools that might help you do some of the, the trickier things like you're talking about and manage and organize those in a better way. Um, let's see here. So we've gone through the simple GUI. I want to add this to this is that when you finish building a GUI, you're typically going to have a PS1 one file, unless you're using one of those tools that I told you about. Some of them will, will save or export as executable. If you're trying to make this success accessible to people, a PS1 file might not be very accessible. They're not going to know what to do with it. They're going to double click on it. They're going to get a notepad or a PowerShell ISE. And they're going to say your, your, your code doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. So uh, I specifically call out PS2 to the EXE because this is the original version of this. There's tons of forks of it. People have wrapped GUIs around it and things like that. I'll show you what that basically looks like. So this is one of the forks of it um, and that gives you a UI to go ahead and put in your source file, your target file gives you some options for suppressing like the console window that pops up when you, you load it and things like that. Uh, I would recommend if you're gonna be handing this stuff out to people that you do something like this. Now, the thing to take note of on this, I have some notes for this because I wanna remember to say it, is it's still, it's basically a wrapper for your PowerShell. It's a, a .NET assembly that contains the base 64 encoded script and uh, execution policy matters, 
having PowerShell matters, having .NET matters. So it's not a fully standalone executable. You need to have all those prereqs there. And so just be aware of that. And I'll also show you real quick. I took our GUI and saved it to an executable and it still runs, right? So, next item, platforms. So, and especially as I've been talking to people here at the conference, there's a lot of different things that people use that I had never used before. Um, the things that I was aware of, WebGIA, PowerShell Universal, are really great tools for taking your scripts, giving them some sort of user interface, and putting them typically in a central location on a server or something like that, where people can access them and use them. Uh, I was actually surprised at how many people hadn't heard of PowerShell Universal, um, but that's one of the ones that I've, I've looked at quite a bit. I haven't used it for work or anything, but I've definitely fiddled around with it a lot. It's a really cool tool. Um, I had other people that talked about, you know, they were using Toad, which is, I don't think necessarily as much for UIs, but making your scripts accessible via API. Um, someone had said something about they were using uh, Jenkins, and so people were basically inputting stuff into Jenkins and then that was becoming uh, the parameters for their, their scripts and stuff like that. And so that's kind of another way. There's plenty of ways to give essentially user interfaces to people. They don't even know that's PowerShell behind the scenes, right? So let me show you PowerShell Universal. I'm going to start from the first page. So one of the things to be aware of, uh, it didn't log me out, but one of the things to be aware of is you're now taking, building a platform, right? I'm installing PowerShell Universal on a server so that multiple people can access it. it um, you know, right now I just have, it's on my local machine, I'm just putting the IP address, but maybe there needs to be DNS, right? Um, there might be, need to be certificates that you need to manage for it. Uh, you know, it gives you a lot of functionality, but at the same time, now you have a, a platform to manage. You have a server to update, you have a tool to update. So that's why I think, you know, the, the main thing I want people to get out of this talk is there's different ways to handle different use cases and your use case might not require going out and, and installing PowerShell Universal on a server for people to use. It could be as simple as just doing out grid view for people so that they can use some script that you put together more easily, right? So PowerShell Universal, I did kind of the same stuff that I was doing with the other scripts, but uh, in this case, I built out a page, um, actually two pages. One is creating users and uh, managing the accounts, locked, unlocked. And the way the locked accounts works is it's a script that runs scheduled in the background the output of that script gets refreshed a uh, random amount of time. I forget what I set it to, like 20 seconds or something like that. And so when I go ahead and add stuff to this, you'll see it gets added um, eventually. Well, it gets added immediately, but you won't see it until it refreshes. But you have your form, you can create your user. Um, the go back is a, a function that you can select in there. Um, it'll pop up over here eventually. But then you can also, in this, I can create buttons in here. These buttons have scripts behind them. So when I go ahead and click on uh, this one, it's gonna lock or unlock that account. Uh, when I click on the remove, it'll remove the account. And uh, it's actually very simple to put some of this stuff together. So my create user is a script, it's my create local user PS1 script. It's running as the default user in PowerShell 5.1. Um, I have the fields username and password. I show that it's, you know, it's a text box, it's a password field. And I don't think there's anything else to show on that. Um, and that's, uh, there's also one other thing I, I forgot to show is uh, there's a reload section there, so if you normally set up a form and let people submit, you know, can, only can submit once, 
there's a reload thing that gives you the option to refresh to the beginning and, and uh, submit it a second time. Um, over here, you can see my test 13 showed up. I also disabled that test 10 account, um, but it's, it's very similar, right? I'm just pointing it to a script. For my data source, I have all my columns here. Um, I tell it what the property name from the, the output of that script is that I want to show and what I wanna call that field. And then my buttons, I tell it's the type button and in the button settings, I point it to the script I want it to run for that button. And that's the majority of that. Uh-oh, I hear clapping. I should be almost done then. Um, so when I go to uh, scripts, that's what I want to show you. These scripts have become very simple and very easy. Um, for instance, uh, create local user. I don't even need the first line. That was just for debugging and stuff. Um, New local user, I take the username and password they give me, that's all there is to it. For um, the most difficult one is lock unlock account because I have to check the sta status of the account before I lock it or unlock it. And once I know I can do either or. Um, and so yeah, there's a lot of cool things you can do in here. This also has dashboards and things. Uh, one of one uh, item I wanted to mention earlier I forgot to is that there are some different use cases you might have. One I was thinking of that uh, could be valuable is around uh, dashboards. You can build dashboards into PowerShell Universal where it's going and pulling some information and showing it in a dashboard. Those are great for managers, right? Um, and, you know, you could do other UI type things uh, where, you know, maybe it's just pulling some information to, to show a, a manager for a, a migration or something like that. But you know, they probably tap you on the shoulder every day. Hey, can you give me this information? And you're just running a PowerShell script. Well, maybe you could just give them something that they could run to get that information themselves, right? And so that's another reason why, you know, these UIs can be, can be useful and maybe save you a little bit of time. And so just to wrap up, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, the pitfalls one more time. Uh, GUI is complicated development. Um, like I said, you're gonna be doing more testing. You're gonna be testing things with the UI, not just the code. It requires significantly more code. You gotta write all the UI elements. You gotta do things like you were talking about is, hey, I wanna validate their input and I don't want them to be able to click this button until I validate it. That stuff gets uh, very complicated in code and you gotta set these states and you gotta constantly do that kind of stuff. And so um, the code gets really messy and can be difficult to maintain. Um, maintaining platforms. So like I said, with, with WebGIA or PowerShell Universal, you now have a server and a platform to maintain. They're gonna require upkeep and you will own this, you know, as long as you're at the company. So just be aware of that. You know, when you build these tools, that's gonna be a problem. One other thing that someone had brought up the other day too is version control on this stuff. When you start handing this stuff out to non developers, non-PowerShell users, you might end up with multiple versions of these things out there that are gonna live forever. So start thinking about how you're gonna do version control. One of the nice things about the platforms is they're going to one place to do it. And so when you make your updates, it's in that same location. So uh, if you start handing out executables, you gotta be aware that that stuff could be out there for a while. Um, so that's pretty much it for the talk. Um, just some other info. Uh, I'm not a huge social media person, but I do have a Twitter, uh, at it's Kevin locks. Apparently Kevin locks was already taken surprisingly. Um, LinkedIn, Kevin locks, you can look for me. I should come right up. Uh, I am, like I said, co-lead of RTP SUG. If you want to join us, we have really great presentations. There's a lot of information we have RTP SUG.com at RTP SUG. Our YouTube channel I think has, I think close to 150 videos now, um, but I do the editing of our user group for that. So there's tons of information out there on stuff like PowerShell Universal and other things. Um, if you wanna join one of our meetings, all of them are virtual. So meetup.com, Research Triangle PowerShell User Group. And I wanna add this other thing here because uh, since the pandemic, there are not a lot of user groups anymore. Start your own user group. 
even if it's just a few people at work or something like that, do it. Just get some people together, talk about PowerShell, meet, start doing your own talks. Uh, I love the PowerShell community. It's done great things for my career. I am not the most social or outgoing person. I am not the best speaker, but I wanna give back to the community. And so that's why I do talks. That's why I do the PowerShell user group because it's given a lot to me. So I'd encourage everybody else to do talks, do user groups and be a part of the community. And that's it. So thank you everybody. Um, you can review the session. If anybody has any quick questions, um, I'm technically over by a minute, but um, I'll stay up here and I can answer questions. Nope, thank you.